Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Now and Men, the podcast about men, masculinities and gender equality. Uh, I'm Sandy Ruxton, I'm here with Stephen Burrell as always. Uh, it's obviously been a really quiet time in the UK recently, Stephen, with not much going on. H- how are you doing? Yes, I'm. hi Sandy and hi everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm well, thanks. And uh, yeah, we're certainly living in changing times here in the UK at the moment, aren't we? Um, but yeah, for today's episode, uh, we're very pleased to have with us Dr Jade Lavelle. Uh, so Jade is a senior lecturer in criminology and gender violence at the University of Bristol. Uh, so her work focuses on gender-based violence, serious youth violence and masculinities. And Jade's just had a great book published with Bristol University Press called Boys, Childhood, Domestic Abuse and Gang Involvement, Violence at Home, Violence on Road. And before becoming a researcher, she was based for over 10 years in organisations working to end gender-based violence, including a refuge for women and children, a rape crisis centre and other projects supporting survivors. So you've obviously got a lot of frontline and research experience, Jade. It's really great to have you with us today. Oh, thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm already an avid listener of the podcast. So yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for listening. <laughs> um, so yeah, perhaps we could start off by talking a bit about your book. Um, mm-hmm. So in it, you look at the experiences of a group uh, who are perhaps not often enough discussed uh, in relation to domestic abuse, uh, that of children, and perhaps in particular boys. Of course, children are victims in their own right uh, when it comes to domestic abuse taking place in the home. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit about the what impacts this has on, on children, and perhaps especially um, in terms of you know what, it, what the experiences of boys are like in this regard? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as you mentioned, now children are seen as victims in their own right, and that's almost unbelievable that, that that's been such a recent change um, in terms of UK legislation, because we've known for a long time that domestic violence impacts on children in various ways, Um, can have a range of trauma responses in the short term, and also very long term. Um, And it's been long considered a sort of safeguarding issue. And we've known a bit about the the co-prevalence with other forms of child abuse. So we know that it has an impact, but it's still it's still something that's been under research and under focused on, I guess. Um, I think we're starting, especially with boys, learning about the impact from sort of celebrities speaking out. You know, we've had Ian Wright and Patrick Stewart, you know, talking about mm. trying to deal with their, you know, experiences long into their adulthood. So I think we know that it has a, a massive impact on children. Um, but yeah, I did want to find out more, particularly around boys. Mm. Yeah, and so so the research uh, you did, um, which you talk about in the book, uh, is based on interviews with with men who had experienced domestic abuse in the home as children, mm. uh, and who then went on to become involved in gangs, uh, or who went on road, mm-hmm. as as it's called. So so the book brings together two quite big topics, mm. which I suppose are typically treated quite separately. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is it that kind of childhood domestic abuse and gang involvement have to do with each other? Like how did they? connect together in the lives of the men you interviewed Mm. and perhaps could you also just uh, explain what this term on road means because I hadn't uh, come across that before yes yeah um so I came to know that there was this connection or that it was worth looking at you know childhood domestic violence and and life on road or in gangs because I've I was working in policy um about eight years ago I was leading the strategic response around domestic violence, children and health in West London. And so my sort of responsibility was to to look at referral pathways and see where the gaps were for support. And I spoke to a a gang's outreach worker um, and he said 90% of his caseload were child survivors of domestic abuse, but who were not really getting any support or recognition for that. I mean, just to say in terms of the the term of on road, on road is a concept that young people are more likely to use themselves to refer to kind of street life hustle that could involve, you know, low life or crime, drug dealing, you know, what what maybe from the outside we might call gangs. I mean, the, the term gangs is very contentious um, and is obviously linked with you know, the policing of, of, of youth groups. So the men that I interview did say they'd been both on road and in gangs but they sort of referred to gangs as more the the organized 
aspect of of their life but on road being like the wider youth culture the street life culture they were involved in um but yeah that you know when i first started talking to this colleague and he said this he has this high prevalence i started to think hang on what why am i working in domestic violence service and we've never actually dealt with these young people we've never seen these young people in the services i was working with so i guess i knew then that we have a gap um we needed to find out more about mm. and is there because you talk in the book as well about how there is perhaps a, still an element of like discomfort or not really knowing what to do with boys mm. who are in a kind of domestic abuse situations um yeah do you want to say a little bit about like that like why, why do you think that is that perhaps boys are still quite a kind of neglected or or un- under understood group uh, when it comes to this issue yeah i think um in some ways, that's partly about the legacy of the of the domestic violence sort of sector, support sector that was was started by women survivors to support other women survivors, right? You know, although children were sort of dealt with or offered services, you know, from the, you know early days of refuges in the seventies, they were still seen as a sort of add on to the mother who was the primary victim, for good reason. Um, but what's happened, I think, then is is that they were kind of boys were sort of the blind spot because you know even now most refuges have an age limit for boys, boys' sons um, of of the of the women who are accessing refuge. And and the, the, when I was working in a refuge, they wouldn't allow boys in over twelve years old. You know, I remember speaking to people saying, "Well, why?" Um, and you know, there's this idea that that being, you know, an adult bodied, you know, adolescent boy might scare, you know, other victims, make them feel uncomfortable. Perhaps there's this risk of them becoming perpetrators. So in a way, we've sort of dealt with it as a sector by kind of just, you know, putting it out of our mind and saying, well, I don't know, they're not our primary client in a way. So they've left these boys to sort of be unsupported. And, you know, what I was looking at, with my research is that hang on a second we've got these boys who are offered nothing but by the time they're you know 12 13 they're cropping up in youth offending teams so hang on a second what why aren't we supporting them um you know there's so much more that we can we can do but it is a tricky one um i think in general we haven't really looked at gender and children you know we've been thinking about children as just this homogenous homogenous group so yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? When when you think that we haven't really focused on that historically. I guess there's a question about where those boys then live as well. Mm. I mean, if they can't live in the refuge, yeah. you know, do they go back to the perpetrator's house or do they yeah. live independently? I mean, I, I don't know if you have a, a sense of that, but I mean, that's quite, quite a big issue, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, refuge is obviously the sharp end of domestic abuse support. So the the families that end up in a refuge generally have very few other options you know many families would you know pay for their own um different housing or or do flee in a different way um but i think you're right they either the the mother would have to go and leave the the son with the perpetrator i think that often happens people think having a male role model is actually a good thing you know um or they'd have to find some different solutions or you know son would go into care but i think it is the very sharp end, but I think it, it tells us a lot about the wider ways we consider, you know, support for children. I, I do find that term on road quite powerful as well, in a way, because I feel like it captures how perhaps for a lot of these boys, maybe they didn't really have a safe home that they could go back to. And like, so a lot of their lives might be on the streets, you know. Yeah. Do, do you want to say anything ab- about that? About like, what are those factors which you think would then perhaps lead boys into mm. engaging in perhaps forms of kind of criminality or, yeah, harmful behavior or just, you know, uh, engaging in behaviors which, yeah, society isn't necessarily very happy about mm. kind of thing. Like, what, how is that? Um, where does that connect to the issue of domestic abuse in, in your eyes? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a sort of, a perfect storm in a way because I guess it's always important to you know make clear most child survivors don't end up in you know in gangs on road being criminalized most you know the, the 
prevalence is so high, most just get on with their lives and, you know, maybe no one even realises. But, mm. you know, the men that, that I was talking to about this research had this perfect storm of maybe racial marginalisation. They lived in a gang-affected area or an area where there was, you know, opportunities for other people to get them involved in life on road. So several of the men I spoke to were starting to deal drugs or do favours around drug dealing from as young as eight, you know. So there's these opportunities, living in poverty, you know, having premium from working class background, you know. So so there was this perfect storm that happens to these particular boys who, Mm -hmm. who, who are in these sort of urban areas which men and like and exactly as you said if home's not safe and you don't want to be there they spend more time outside of their house and then they get embroiled in this in this life um you know some of the the men that I spoke to in a way the domestic abuse or the the resilience that they had to violence the almost the way that they'd almost been brutalized at home to to Mm -hmm. you know seeing living with with violence and made them more tough when they were out on the streets or in the school they were able to be more hard more you know get esteem for being tougher to fight so it it worked in a in an interesting way but for some actually they made the most of that resource when they were out uh, on road in the book you use the great concept by raywin connell who we've actually interviewed on the podcast previously of uh, what she calls protest masculinity. And I think it relates to, probably to just what to what you've just been saying. Mm. I wondered if you could just explain what that concept means and what it had what it has to do with the men that you spoke to. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely draw drew on the idea of the hierarchy of masculinity. So you know that there's this this ideal hegemonic version of which. I always say in training like this James Bond, you know, white, middle class, wealthy, you know, type of masculinity, which although few men reach, we all look to as the revered version. But for the men that that took part in my research, you know, for the sort of intersectional reasons I was just mentioning, maybe they think that they're never going to achieve that. You know, it's so out of what is in the realm of possibility for them. And uh, Connell talks about then for some men they engage in this protest masculinity which is almost a a completely alternative um, system which values this you know maybe gangster tough often associated with crime and you know we can think about like this idea of of being the man on the street um, you know and then this was something that a lot of the participants I spoke with talked about the difference between being a man And being the man, you know, tougher than the rest, able to fight, you know, street wise, hustling. So it's a different type of being on top um, that that marginalized men sometimes engage with. So I found that really helpful. And and presumably it it involves, you know, the use of violence to gain status, to gain respect. But that Mm. can, as I think you're suggesting, also sit alongside other forms of masculinity which are perhaps more mm. more vulnerable yeah would that be a fair assessment yeah. of how you would look at this yeah I was very interested in vulnerability because you know what you've got that's interesting and this is where it becomes quite complicated with the the idea of who is a victim and who is a perpetrator because you have these young men these boys who actually have this kind of existential vulnerability caused by the domestic abuse you know their home isn't safe you know they're they're living in fear at home and then to navigate that intense vulnerability they are almost performing a absolute opposite of that so they're coming across completely invulnerable they're they're Mm -hmm. seeming you know some of them talked about like this idea of going nuts you know seeming almost so unpredictably tough strong violent you know and it's a way to manage this sort of fear inside um basically you have to either be afraid be in living in fear or be feared you know and so i think there are two sides of the same Mm -hmm. coin really you know you don't get that 
overt protest masculinity without this intense vulnerability that's being hidden. Mm. It's so so fascinating that dichotomy there, isn't it? Mm. I, I wanted to also ask you about your your research method as well because that's quite interesting too. So so you used an approach called music elicitation, as I understand it, and I wondered mm-hmm. if you could lo- tell us a little bit more about how that works and and why you used it. Mm. So in a in a nutshell, it's a kind of desert island discs approach. You know, it's something that we know journalistically is quite common. Um, so in in the interviews, I would ask people for three songs, three tracks to help tell their life story. Now they knew I was interested in domestic violence and and life on road, but I didn't ask any questions. And in in many interviews, that was it. They then led the interview so they could play whatever track they wanted in whatever order at whichever point they they felt they wanted to and it was so it's so simple but it's so powerful because they're able to curate that space so they lead uh Mm -hmm. you become the audience or the listener um and what was amazing i mean you know that there was no i didn't dictate a genre at all but some people chose sort of hip hop tracks, which dealt with the most sensitive topics. So hip hop tracks around sexual abuse, around you know, violence, uh, rejection, about how much they love their mom. And so, you know, they were able to use the, the lyrics or the music video or whatever they wanted to say. Um, and what the, the reason it's so powerful is because music actually relates to all of us. We can all think about a track that meant something Mm -hmm. or that is linked to a memory. So, you know, I'll tell you. So I've been doing, um, since since the book research, recently I've been engaged in a study in Albania with men who have been involved in serious and organized crime. And so I've been leading a team looking, uh, using music elicitation with men in prison and on probation and we found there as well we're having similar results that we're having lots of interviews where the researcher doesn't ask anything and we're having very um candid uh testimonies and sharing you know you've seen in the book talked about experiences of sexual violence and things now i wouldn't have asked about that but people were open to share more than what they expected to i think using the music method But in the Albania, I've been also developing music elicitation as an intervention tool. And so in July, I was training professionals about how to use music to connect with young people that they're they're reaching through youth work, social work. And I asked the professionals, pick a song which reminded you of a time where you felt you mattered. And that's a simple question because it could be something like a wedding song or something, you know, a song from your childhood. But actually what happened in the training was people were in tears and some people were sharing with their colleagues, you know, about bereavement, about very in-depth things. So it's so the, the point is to create a question which can be as light touch or as deep as that individual wants to share. Um, and yeah, it really reaches people. It's so simple and low resource, but so powerful. So music provides their sort of access to to memory, you know, mm-hmm. to some extent, some sort of some sort of catharsis, perhaps as well, yes. co- coping. Yeah, it sounds incredibly powerful. I wanted to move on slightly, but you you talk about how domestic abuse is rarely considered within discussions of serious violence, mm-hmm. and uh, interestingly, we we also rarely talk about how forms of serious violence and gang involvement have a lot to do with gender and, and masculinity, just like domestic abuse. What, why mm. do you think that is the case? Mm. Yeah, um, I think in a sort of practical way, I think that the the sort of sectors that have grown to deal with these two types of issues have sort of evolved quite separately. An interesting when we think about gender, they have evolved in a gendered way. So we have the domestic violence sector, which is very women-led, women-focused, um, because of the origins from you know, the, the feminist movement. So you often get you know, lots of women working in their women-only spaces. 
and then you've got the what the sort of gang serious youth violence sector which you know has its own sort of logics and you know lots of sort of different people working in them both so i think partly it's it's the practicalities of that they get funded separately and that there's not the crossover that happens naturally i think it's also the gendered issue of space you know domestic violence is still seen as a hidden private in the domestic sphere um and even in the recent um serious violence duty consultation the government put out they're focusing on public space violence so we have this public private split that you know public space violence is about what's hitting the headlines you know serious youth violence is you know a big concern for people living in cities obviously seeing you know young people getting stabbed and harmed that is hitting the headlines in a different way in a way domestic violence is such a mundane form of violence like it just rumbles on in the background sometimes barely even making headlines so we're kind of used to it whereas you know serious violence is is the new thing perhaps um but i think there's a lot of potential you know that government's been commissioning violence reduction units there's potential for this to be brought together but you know interestingly it's discretionary at the moment that that violence reduction units whether they include domestic violence or not so you know we can talk about the semantics of a serious violence versus domestic mm -hmm. violence in itself is a problem mm -hmm. you know sure no and i think your research really powerfully demonstrates that these things you can't just easily separate them out right they're they're interconnected and overlapping if, and people's lives can't just be broken down into these neat little boxes mm -hmm. um yeah, and I suppose it shows as well that for many men and boys, and perhaps especially those who have uh, fewer economic resources in the first place, mm. they're often growing up uh, with different forms of violence and abuse being normalized, you know, in many parts of their their lives, which are obviously going to have traumatic impacts on them. Um, and perhaps, as, as you said earlier, it shows that, you, you know, we can't necessarily easily draw distinctions between kind of victims and perpetrators or offenders mm. when it comes to violence and abuse. Um, so what do you think we can, or, or what do you think we should do with that understanding, I guess? I mean, do you think that there are policies which need to change as a result of that kind of understanding? Um, you know, what are the implications in terms of trying to prevent violence and abuse from happening in the first place in, in your eyes? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it's, it's one I've been thinking a lot about because, you know, the violence reduction units are coming out of a sort of public health approach to violence, which has been a model which has been, you know, effective and quite popular when it comes to dealing with you know, serious youth violence or gang related violence. Um, and it's this idea that, yeah, there's violent communities, you know, violence can be, be considered in an epidemic way. So that has been effective, but doesn't necessarily fit easily with the ways we think about gender-based violence and particularly domestic violence, because in a way we still want to hold the perpetrators to account, right? So, so this is where we get this language of victims and perpetrators more in the domestic violence side, because it's actually really important from that perspective to identify, you know, the primary aggressor, you know, who's the person who's, you know, exerting power and control. So. This is where I think it needs a lot more thinking because, because they are almost coming from different logics. Although when it comes to children, and this is what I've tried to emphasize in the book, is that these are children. How I don't think it's very useful for us to be labeling children as perpetrators of violence. So I'm, I'm trying, I guess, as the first step to think about how do we support these children, boys and girls, but particularly boys who we know are at this risk of, you know, especially, you know, in these gang affected areas are more at risk of becoming involved in serious youth violence. We're actually not doing hardly anything to support them at the point in which they are direct victims of domestic abuse as a prevention. So that I think is the first step. Um, mm -hmm. But I think strategically, it is bringing a, a lot of questions about about how we think about violence and and what we want to do about it. Yeah, it's complicated. 
No, but that's interesting, isn't it? Because I do think your research actually does have a lot of ramifications in terms of thinking about prevention, doesn't it? That if we can stop these experiences of violence from happening in the first place, perhaps that in turn can stop more violence down the road, I guess. Which which also brings into question this idea of the so-called kind of cycle of violence mm. um, and the kind of theory around that, that, you know, boys who do experience violence or trauma when growing up are more likely to then perpetrate themselves when they get older. Mm. And I suppose on the one hand, you know, there seems to be some obvious validity to that. But on the other hand, perhaps it's quite simplistic, deterministic, mm -hmm. maybe taking responsibility away, as you say, from, mm -hmm. you know, men who do choose to use violence. You know, that is a choice, isn't it? And it's certainly not inevitable. So what do you think about the kind of cycle of violence theory? And, and what does your research kind of, what can your research uh, tell us about that, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's the funny old thing that idea because in a way and especially in domestic violence sector it's sometimes like the elephant in the room because as you say it it can be very stigmatizing we know that most child survivors you know carry on and live in normal life in fact many of them including several that took part in my research are actively anti-domestic violence, anti-gender violence. So mm -hmm. it, it clearly doesn't offer an explanation of it on, by itself, this, this idea of this social learning theory. However, we also have these exclusion criteria, say in Refuge, that says, well, we don't want adolescent boys in our services because the unspoken aspect is that we think that they might be, end up being violent, you know, you know, aggressive so so it is something almost we need to name it to get it out the way and say what do we do with this we, we do have some research that says boys may be more likely to perpetrate violence but it's not all of them and that's where in my research I've focused particularly on masculinity particularly mm. on patriarchy because mm. I think it's much more complicated than thinking if you see violence as a boy you're going to carry out violence well it's not that simple and that's why in the book mm -hmm. I put long form narratives from the participants because I wanted people to really understand this is complicated you can see how they're dealing with the difficulties of I don't want to be like my dad but I'm equally really terrified and I'm sick of being a victim and I'm you know you can you can feel that in attention that has the same result in a way that is you they've experienced violence and they end up being violent sometimes. So I'm thinking a bit more about actually patriarchy harms men, harms boys. And, and this we need to really think about the wider expectations on boys to be tough and hard and invulnerable, you know? So I think mm -hmm. it's, I'm hoping that, that, that my book adds depth to that idea. But I don't think we can throw it completely out because we do have a problem here. You know, we people keep being violent. So something's got to change. It's not working. Mm. But uh, to, move, to move on to a, a slightly different issue, um, there's been quite a lot of discussion in the last week or two here in the UK since uh, on Monday, the 5th of September, uh, London Metropolitan Police shot and killed a 24-year-old man called Chris Cabot um, after a police pursuit where he was found to actually be unarmed and he was about to become a father for the first time um and this has really kind of renewed the spotlight in the uk on how you know young black men are, are treated by the police what do you think this case tells us about assumptions society might still make about kind of black masculinity and and young working class men um i mean did these kinds of stereotypes impact on the lives of the the men you spoke to in your research uh, for example mm. Yeah, it's very, um, very sad, you know, and, I, and I've been following this case and, you know, my heart goes out to, to the family and community that have been affected. Um, and it, and it, is, it is something that I was, you know, been thinking about in my research, because although I had quite a diverse um, participant group, you know, there were not all black men, certainly most were and were acutely aware of this uh, you know, disproportionate focus that the police has on young men and particularly young black men who are identified as gang involved or seen as um, being involved in a gang. Now, you know, we know after the sort of scandal of the gangs matrix uh, in London that, that this is fraught with overt and covert racism. You know, when the 
in the gangs matrix, they found 78% of boys on that list were black, but the Met's own figures showed that only 27% of those who were actually responsible for serious youth violence were black in London. So, you know, we knew that, that these sort of policing um, monitoring practices are disproportionately affecting young black boys. And it, I, when I was looking at a um, comment from Chris Cabber's mum, it really struck me when she, when she was talking about if he was white, he would have been arrested. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it is an absolute fundamental denial of justice for him to have been shot and not even given the chance to access justice to be have, have a fair trial. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it... Um, you know, it, it does raise these questions, you know, when I'm talking, you know, in the book, we're talking about children who are victims of violence, who are identified as perpetrators. Once this whole idea of being labelled as a young offender or criminalised um, is, a, is a life and death issue for many young, young black people in our cities. Um, and and in, in my book, I did a analysis of all, all the serious case reviews that were relevant that had childhood domestic abuse and some form of labeling of being on road in county lines in gangs and it was shocking really because what I found was when when that happened it was just this increase in surveillance of these young people seldom actually the support that they needed certainly not around domestic abuse in most cases but it was just this as soon as they had this label then there was meeting after meeting about them and what was to be done about their case, but there was not much empathic practice. And I know there's research, particularly around, you know, young black boys um, and that how they're adultified. You know, they're seen as invulnerable, mm -hmm. as older than they are. They're seen as, as um, you know, less in need of help, you know. So it, mm -hmm. so it does raise, you know, that case raises a lot of questions that we have to face when we're thinking about what's an ideal intervention for boy child survivors, because some boys are seen as a potential risk or a potential problem before they've even done anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some really serious issues in there. I mean, this, this is going to sound like a bit of a gear change, but uh, I, I wondered, you know, why it was that you came to become interested in this area of research. What, what motivated you to look specifically at the experiences of boys and young men uh, when it comes to domestic abuse? Yeah, um, it's funny, actually, because, you know, I wrote a little bit about it in the book. And it's really the first time during my research um, that I've come to sort of join it all together as to why that I do what I do. But basically, I'm lived with domestic abuse in childhood myself, you know, and it, and it's, it's so difficult to to say to people, you know, actually, by the time you're 18, you've lived with that many years of violence and abuse. So it's it was it was part of the everyday reality of my childhood. And basically, what I found interesting, you know, and I, I obviously, it's taken me a lot of years to reflect back. But when I faced, you know, difficult moments as, as in my childhood, I would head for the library, right? You know, I, I, I sort of dealt with those experiences by becoming very nerdy. And that's how come here I am, you know, still in the university. Um, but my brother, and, you know, and, I, and he doesn't mind me saying a little bit about it. He, you know, his life went totally the different way. You know, and he was involved in, you know, in, in, he was, it had addictions. He got involved with the wrong crowd. He's had a lot of challenges. And you know, when I was younger, that that just felt like one of those things. But as I worked in the gender based violence sector, for, you know, for always, um, I started to think about these things like when I was in refuge and we were having to reject sons. And I started to think, how, how can this sector, which has, you know, be offered me so much comfort, you know, as a survivor, feeling like I'm putting my pain to use, feeling like I'm making a difference. How can this place in which is designed to support victims, how could that have said to my brother, sorry, not you, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just, it just started to bother me. And I thought, okay, fine, let's go a little bit upriver. So I, I 
moved from the refuge to a a job in this policy, you know, strategic coordination. Okay, and this is where I ended up talking to this colleague about about this high prevalence of child survivors in the gang service. And again, I was thinking, well, hang on, I haven't seen any anywhere written that recognises this. I can't see any support service that's actually really trying to reach these boys. Instead, we're sort of saying, oh, goodness, look, they're the problem. These are the violent young people. The, you know, it, they become perpetrators. You know, there's a whole service, services set up for that. And again, I thought, you know, we're failing these boys. You know, what if that is my brother? You know, how can, how can we write them off? You know, and actually, if we want to really prevent violence, what are we doing? If we really believe they are more likely to be violent, and obviously we've talked about that that's problematic in itself. But if we believed it, for let's say, why are we not doing anything? We're just letting it happen. So then, okay, I'll go up river more, then do, to research. And here we are trying to still figure out how do we prevent this? So that, you know, it's, it's an, a sort of a never ending motivation really to do this work. And it's been quite interesting, you know, during my time in this sector that there's been this sea change, you know, children have only been recognized as direct victims of domestic violence last year. And so that is a funny thing, you know, it, it, all of that time before it was never something that discussed or mentioned because we weren't really seen as the main concern. You were just there. You just happened to be there when it was happening. So it's this long period of reckoning really of, of actually making visible the experiences of children who really are powerless in homes where domestic abuse is happening. They have absolutely no way to stop it um, or to solve it. And that was reflected in, you know, the narratives in my book as well. It's this, it's this ultimate powerlessness, which, mm. you know, I'm trying to shed a light on really. Well, thanks for sharing that, Jade, that uh, personal story, your, your narrative. I mean, you know, it's obviously quite... Um, important too that you you are able to speak out about that about what happened to you to your family and you know presumably that will strike hopefully chords for others as well and encourage them to work out how they can deal with their own uh, traumas their own their own pain as well but um mm. i mean moving on from that I, I, you know i mean you're obviously a mother as well now you know and i i wonder how your your work your research your experience feeds into being a mother too because mm. you know <laughs> we're all playing out this stuff as parents aren't we really so yeah yeah well and it's all been on a similar um certainly the research side has happened at the same time as uh, as becoming a mother because i was my eldest was one when i started my phd and then i had twins halfway through so <laughs> they're my they're my <laughs> phd babies and you can just imagine right that you know how uh, how busy that's been um <laughs> You know, and I chose it that way, and it has, you know, a research career can work really well with small children. Um, you know, I've been able to work flexibly. I, you know, pick them up from school most days, and, you know, it's it's a hustle, but you can work at whatever time you want to. So that I think, actually, there's a lot of it which works well. I mean, you know, my kids are very well-traveled. They've been to all these places with me for research and conference and mm -hmm. you know so there's a lot of good things but obviously it takes its toll and it is a very intensive uh field to be working in I mean obviously they don't have a clue you know the, the topics <laughs> or the subject matter um you know I have to say mummy's written a book but I'm not sh really showing you the front <laughs> cover because you know it's not that kind of thing um you know I think one day that they'll be able to make sense of of what I'm doing and and why you know and some days I think oh I just want to go and open a cafe a bookshop be a tattoo apprentice <laughs> you know I'm sure we all have you know everyone's got their sort of side hustle dream um when it gets too much but yeah I think it works all right actually I mean it was there was one particular song in the research which is called um my old lady by Omi and oh my goodness that is about love love for your for for your mother and you know and how you know she carried you and she's fed you and and looks after you and oh I, you know that really got me I think I was pregnant at the time of the interview and mm. 
every time I listen to that song, it fills me with all sorts of feelings around being like a mother researcher, you know, obviously my own past and it, it all comes together because the personal is political, right? I mean, this is so, this can't be disentangled really, um, which is why it's such an important topic, but I think everyone who works in the field of gender-based mm -hmm. violence has this overlapping, um, you know, it's constantly, whether it's your neighbors experiencing it or friends or, you know, every now and then it, it rears its head in your personal life as well as your work life. And it, and it is a lot sometimes. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah. And so you've also been conducting research, I think, with a few other people looking at kind of work with perpetrators of domestic abuse in various countries, uh, including the UK, Cyprus, Italy, Greece, Romania. And I think you just recently talking about the pandemic published an article on how these programs have adapted during this time. Um, mm. So yeah, we were just wondering if you could perhaps just say a little bit about, you know, what, uh, in your view, what are some of the key components really of kind of effective work with with perpetrators, perhaps, you know, which your research might be highlighting as well. Mm. And are there lessons, you know, which can be learned from what's going on in other countries with that kind of work? Yeah, I mean, that's been a very interesting project because it, it just started, the funding just started the month before COVID lockdown came. So goodness me, it all changed um, and went online. And, and the interesting thing with that project is it's focused particularly on non-criminal justice early intervention work and particularly around capacity building with professionals. And that's been a very interesting focus because... So as so often happens, the funding landscape sort of is drawn towards the high risk cases. Now, that makes sense because in the, in the end of the day, it's murder prevention, really, in, you know, in its most extreme form is, is that's what local areas want to prevent most of all. But now we're at that time where we can start to say, OK, we have some infrastructure around high risk perpetrators. What are we doing actually for those men who are going to their GP and, and having those initial disclosures or, you know, trying to seek help? And it links back to the conversations we've been having today, really, is like, what is early? What is early? Is early intervention with a child survivor, a boy child survivor of domestic abuse? Because in a way, it's not early for them. <laughs> They've already gone through all that trauma and abuse themselves. So that's what I've been finding really interesting is what is ideal early point? You know, we've, we've worked in partnership with a lot of frontline providers in the UK and, you know, we've got, we've seen different models, which is, you know, whether it's respects make a change program and they've been focusing on early being before people might identify themselves as a perpetrator. So, you know, how do you get people to feel identified what they've been doing is wrong? I've been talking to the Hampton Trust who have interventions for first arrest, although we know that first arrest is probably, well, almost certainly not the first assault. So it's been really interesting to have, to explore uh, those questions. But I think it's come back really for us about the coordinated community response. And we need areas to have good coordination, good strategic oversight so that somebody can disclose uh, in all of different points, different services within an area and receive a good response that all links up in the right way. And that just hasn't, it just doesn't happen. I mean, it's fascinating for me because I used to work in that model in West London and in London, you know, there's a lot more funding, a lot more connection and resources. So it worked there. But, you know, we were doing the, this training in the southwest, you know, lots of rural professionals and it and it feels much less developed. So I think and I know that the Domestic Abuse Commissioner is now focusing on actually we need parity across all areas of the UK in terms of funding, in terms of response. And until we've got that, we can't even really get into you know, further ideal points, you know, pe some people in some areas aren't even getting the minimum that, that's required really for perpetrators. So lots to do. Yeah, yeah, because there's something interesting there as well, isn't there, that it feels like there's been some steps forward in terms of un people's understandings about, you know, supporting survivors if somebody comes forward to report, but it, it feels like there's still a lot of discomfort about, oh God, what do you do if somebody comes forward 
because they're concerned about their own behavior. You know, what do you do if you, somebody you know might actually be a perpetrator? Yeah. It seems like there's still a lot of discomfort with that idea, I guess, and a, lot, a lack of knowledge about what to do. And I suppose a lack of services as well that you could even yeah. refer people onto, I guess, isn't it? Although perhaps is that is that changing now, would you say, that has the... The UK government been paying more attention to that, and is that is that a good thing in your view? Or yeah, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, to your first point around discomfort, it's amazing. I would say everyone probably is aware that they know a victim survivor of domestic abuse, at least one, but very few people would say they know a perpetrator unless one's been sort of staring them in the face with their abusive behavior but we clearly do right you know in all of our workplaces and all our communities they are you know statistically they are very commonplace you know but people it is a discomfort yeah. thing people don't want to face up to it mm. and it's also part of the private nature of domestic abuse that it's often hidden and often perpetrators are super charming um, and you might not realize and then that's why victims sometimes aren't believed um, and I think we are in a sea change I mean I was did a little conference on this uh, perpetrator work yesterday and I did a timeline of, of all the policy changes we've had in the last two and a half years and it's a lot you know we've had the Domestic Abuse Act and that's bringing its own uh, requirements for perpetrator work UK's just ratified the Istanbul Convention and that will come in, into place on the 1st of November. So we're certainly in a period of a lot of change and improvement. And I think there's a momentum definitely around improving the response for perpetrators. Um, but obviously, campaigners for victim survivor services are always trying to make clear it can't come at the expense of the budget that is allocated. To, to victim services because that they're always underfunded themselves and this is the problem you know we have so much evidence and data around domestic abuse and what's needed but it it never is adequately resourced um so it's it's just a constant battle really which is frustrating mm. i mean that connects as well to to another question i suppose around obviously at the moment in the uk and in, in lots of other countries we are you know facing this this terrifying cost of living crisis, you know, where a lot of people aren't necessarily going to be able to afford to eat or heat their homes, you know, in, in the months ahead. So I suppose, I mean, what do you think some of the implications of that might be for, for some of the issues you look at in, in your mm -hmm. research, I guess, you know, whether that is domestic abuse or, or trying to prevent, you know, violence in terms of gang involvement and things like that? I mean, yeah, do you have any, any thoughts on, on what the implications of, of this situation it might be? Yeah, it's pretty dire, isn't it? Um, whichever way you think about it. I mean, focusing particularly on on child survivors and particularly on the you know the boys on road that that I was researching with you know they talked about already the impact that poverty had on you know encouraging them to get involved in life on road so you know starting to get involved in you know drug dealing or or robbery or you know some crime to make a bit of extra money to try and you know, sometimes to support their mum, sometimes just to afford the basics. So clearly, financial pressures are going to act as a push factor so that more young people will perhaps be, be find themselves, you know, looking for extra opportunities to, to support their mum. Because, you know, domestic abuse can include, you know, economic abuse as part of it. But also when a perpetrator leaves, then lots of, of domestic violence survivors already live in poverty, single parents trying to make ends meet. And so it, there is really no, you know, there, there's not really a hopeful way of looking at it, to be honest. Um, I think, you know, everyone's very worried about what's going to, what's going to happen. Clearly, pe fewer people are going to leave, you know, because it's hard enough anyway. But if you, if you can't even afford the basics, when you're in, a, in an abusive relationship, you know, how do you see the options? And that's why refuges are there, but they're always underfunded. And there's always several people for every one space. There's, you know, 10 mm. scores of people who are trying to get into that bed space. So it's it's dire. It really is dire. It kind of makes you think, I suppose, that, you know, actually is an important part of preventing violence and abuse, I suppose, creating environments where everybody has the resources and the support they need to be able to live and survive in the first place, I guess, isn't it? Yes, um, yes, exactly. Mm. Well, these are 
pretty serious issues to <laughs> come to at this point in our conversation. Um, but I, I think we're probably coming fairly close to the end. But uh, mm. uh, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you mentioned a, a particular song earlier that meant quite a lot to you. And mm. we just wanted to, uh, to ask you if there are any other tracks, maybe two or three, that you wanted to uh, highlight that had been mm. important to you in helping you to tell your own life story. Yeah, it was so funny, isn't it, thinking about that question, because I've asked that question now to a lot of people. <laughs> but yes. it is, My it's apologies. Such, it's such a tricky one. Around. It is such a tricky <laughs> one. Um, you know, it is a tricky one because you think about, OK, so what do you, you know, what do you want to share? What do you want to highlight? Um, I guess when I was thinking about this question um, and I was thinking about, you know, my my journey in this this sector, this field, I thought... The first song I would pick if I was thinking about a song for my childhood is Pink, Family Portrait. Now, there might not be listeners, uh, big fans of Pink, uh, but I would recommend you look at that. It has a great music video and the lyrics are very poignant, actually. So I think that one would have spoken to me from those times before. And actually, that's one of the reasons that I chose that method, because I remember the power of these songs which broke the silence on difficult things, you know, as a child. I think then my, uh, you know, feminist twenties, it's gotta be Eurythmic, sisters doing it for themselves. It has to be, you know, my fire, my fiery <laughs> young, you know, women's studies, university days, when I thought I literally would change everything. Um, <laughs> and then if I think now I'm a bit more settled and, you know, a little less hopeful maybe, I would, I think I would probably choose Tracy Chapman. I'm ready. I think, um, you know, it's been really nice to, to to talk today and to think about it all together. Because when I used to work in refuge, I remember my manager saying to me, "You need to find your voice, Jade. You know, you need to actually say what you think and stand up and be counted." And I didn't then, and it's taken a long time. And I do feel now like I'm ready actually to to you know speak a bit more about my experience my pathway and what matters and and hopefully make change so yeah I do feel this is a good this is a good era you know and I'm just mm -hmm. th this whole research is pointless unless it makes change you know so that's my goal now is to actually this book unfortunately is an expensive academic book but <laughs> you know it's about getting it out there you know and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share because I think we can make a change here that would make a material difference to young boys who are, who are child survivors. So that's what my goal is now. Well, thanks so much for, for highlighting those tracks. I, I could certainly go with your choices, actually. <laughs> mm, <laughs> Probably need to choices. think of our own, don't we, Stephen? But uh, Yeah, but next thanks. episode. That's what yeah. I want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, hey, thanks so much for talking to us today, Jade. That's been really great to yeah. hear more about your research and, and hopefully to help a little bit in, in getting you getting it out there, as you say, because it is so important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And actually, I was thinking as well, so we don't uh, end on too much of a downbeat note as well um, from the previous question that like in terms of thinking about hopeful things like you know actually there are lots of people out there like yourself doing really great work to try and help people and make things better aren't there so no matter what bad things are going on there is some hope there perhaps yes <laughs> but yeah. yeah absolutely thank you <laughs> well thank you so much for for giving your time to speak to us really appreciate yeah, thanks it. indeed <laughs> bye now take care bye, bye. So, Stephen, you'll be pleased to hear that I'm not going to ask you about your Desert Island Discs, which is <laughs> obviously a risk after that conversation. But uh, I, I wonder what you thought of uh, our, our chat with Jade. Yes, well, I'm, I'm pleased you're not as asking that of me because it's actually a really hard question, isn't it? So, it is. But Jade, Jade provided a great answer to. But um, so I appreciate that. But but no, I thought it was a fascinating conversation. I think her research is is really great and is sh shining a lot of light on important and not very well understood issues. Really, you know, I really like how she's exposing these kind of contradictions and complexities that we don't necessarily like to acknowledge. You know, that for example, a lot of men who perpetrate violence uh, who, or who do harmful things themselves have perhaps experienced violence or trauma in their lives at some point. I mean, it makes me think about the episode we did with Dan Boyden, you know, about the work of safe ground with men in prison and how a lot of the men 
you know, that they work within prison have themselves experienced trauma in their lives. So I suppose it does ask those questions about, you know, how do we stop this violence from ever occurring in the first place? So it never becomes normalized in anyone's, in anyone's life. And I thought the point Jade made in relation to that, that what does early intervention look like then? You know, I suppose the point is we just need to be intervening whenever we can, really, isn't it? There isn't necessarily a, a start and an end point to this because this violence is always happening for a lot of people. But uh, yeah, it, and I suppose I think the point as well about that we do need still to think a lot more about how children are impacted by this. I mean, I still think people do perhaps talk and think about domestic abuse uh, and children in terms of children somehow just witnessing it, you know, like witnessing acts, shocking acts of violence when actually I think it's, you know, for a lot of children, it's it's obviously having a much more pernicious, ongoing uh, traumatizing effect on them really to be living in that kind of environment where that's happening um, and it does also make me think about how um, you know perhaps some people perhaps to kind of try and discredit a kind of feminist analysis of domestic abuse you know will make the point that well men can be victims of domestic abuse too which is obviously absolutely right but perhaps even those people don't actually think about how for a lot of male victims of domestic abuse they've been victims of their fathers, you know, when they were boys growing up in a household where their father was abusing their mother and by extension, their children as well. So, so I think, yeah, there's a, um, a lot of people could reflect on that really of this kind of the ripple effects that domestic abuse uh, has on people. But yeah, what did you make of the yeah, conversation? I thought those are all very interesting points, Stephen. I, I, I wanted to pick up on a couple of other things, actually. Uh, one was about uh, music elicitation as uh, research method I thought that was very interesting and, and particularly that you know as in the way that she described it as as a way of changing the dynamic within the interview process and giving the participant a bit more control I thought that was interesting and and obviously the power of music as well in accessing mm. memory or helping you to deal with difficult traumatic issues in your life you know I, I think that's mm. that's all very interesting I'm, I, I'm still intrigued by how you undertake the analysis of of the kinds mm. of songs that uh, your interviewees come up with, you know, um, mm. um, and for example, are they identifying with with the singer or mm. the music itself or the mm. lyrics? You know, how do you make sense of that? And as she said, you know, you're you're there as well as the interviewer. So mm. I guess that's quite a sort of complex little equation in there. But uh, but I was mm. fascinated about. Um, the use of, use of music and and the power of it as well. So so that's one mm. thing to think about. Um, the other one was about the the boundaries of personal and professional. I think and you know what I found powerful about her interview was you know the way that she she talked about her own background and the connections with her research. And and I, I'm sure we know of other people, other examples where. Um, mm -hmm. researchers are, are interested in subjects which have a particular meaning or resonance mm -hmm. for them. I mean, for someone who's, who's worked in the prison sector, I know that there were several of the researchers who were quite well known who had had uh, family members in prison, you know, and there, there mm -hmm. was some sort of driving motivation uh, behind that. So so I'm interested in, mm -hmm. in that too. And, and maybe that's also the case for quite a lot of the rest of us who don't have, you know, mm -hmm. traumatic events of that scale in their lives. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, for for uh, researchers like you and I, you know, maybe there are issues mm. about our relationships with our parents or with our fathers in particular, mm. you know, which mm. in some ways we're playing out through our, our research interests. You know, I, I just think it's a question. Mm. I mean, I don't have an answer to it particularly, but I, I think it's, <laughs> it's something that's interesting to note about social research, I guess. Yeah, no, I think that's so true. I mean, so many social researchers, and actually not just social researchers well, either, true. actually, but scientists as well. You know, the, often mm. there is some personal link to what has inspired them to research that, hasn't there? Which is, which is, I don't think is in any way a bad thing. I think you know that's inevitable, I guess, and and you do see it all the time, and it's very interesting. Um, Makes me wonder why we're yeah. doing this podcast, uh, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly, we're trying to get some yeah. unresolved issues with our own. Uh, <laughs> oh God, I hope it's resolved by the time we finish this podcast. <laughs> well, just maybe, but maybe we should pursue the whole desert island discs format as well, because I, I do think. Uh, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I don't. We'd be able to afford to, because I think you have to probably pay the royalties, which are probably quite a lot, aren't they? But, um, but I, I think there is. I, I agree with you. I think the music station method is really. I can really see how that could work and be very impactful. I mean, me, I'm a you know, big music listener. And I, I obviously it's so in, intertwined with our emotions, isn't it? Different points in our lives, different memories, as you said, 
And I wonder if there's something quite evocative as well in an interview format or like a focus group format, or even, you know, I think there's also like music therapy and things like that, isn't there? That perhaps sometimes you, music allows you to express things because it's this external thing. You know, it's somebody else's story, somebody else's lyrics and emotions. That gives you a vehicle through which you can express your own emotions in a way which is a bit easier, you know, to do, perhaps especially for men who might not be very comfortable always to talk openly about what's going on inside of them kind of thing. So, so no, I think it's very, very powerful, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The only thing is, I don't think we can do Desert Island Discs. That's not very social research, is it, really? Um, <laughs> I was just thinking while you were talking, could we have an alternative title, something like, you know, Urban Squalor Spins or something? You know, <laughs> <laughs> something that that highlights the, the connectedness of our, our lives rather than just sitting on desert islands. Anyway, perhaps with That's that, we should, uh, we should uh, stop before we descend into the totally ridiculous. But... Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. But thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to Now and Men if you haven't already and uh, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Do get in touch with us at nowandmen at gmail.com if you have comments or questions. And uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>